Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Today I'm going to try and do the impossible and that's to compress about three years of my life into the next hour. I checked back and it was about three years ago that I started investigating the cutting properties of some one and a half inch lenses that I had in my collection. Now I've done my reading about energy density and spot sizes and I was promised that 70 watts into a very very small spot size would produce a very very high energy density and that would be great for cutting. So really what I was trying to do was to find out which of the few types of lenses that I had, meniscus, PVD, CVD, whether I used them upside down or the normal way, which would be most efficient at cutting? Well the answer was none of them really because strangely enough the two inch lens that I had in my collection at the time worked substantially better and that was the beginning of the last three years of my life what the hell was going on? and as time has gone on I've come across more and more inconsistencies with the way in which lenses perform against the way lenses are specified and promised to perform so there's something very wrong here it's either my machine, me, or maybe the principle behind how lenses work on a laser machine. I've just arrived at the end of three years of work and I think I've now solved that puzzle. I truly understand how lenses work with a laser machine and it's not the way that people believe. I've seen many, many videos of how to set up the focus how lenses work, why the lens is cut at funny angles. Now that I know the answer, their ideas are humorous. Now my conclusion was reached by a series of elemental steps that were in a rather haphazard and zigzag manner. They were facts that were collected through experiment, failure, going off at tangents, down dead ends, but each one of those added a little bit more to my puzzle and eventually in the last couple of three weeks I've arrived at a complete and full solution to the problem which I'm going to explain to you today in a logical order that I hope you'll be able to follow. I used to own a uh, sheet metal working business where we had a very old cross flow laser, CO2 laser for cutting metal and that laser regularly required its mirrors to be adjusted and tuned and one of the tricks that I learned in those very, very early days was something called a mode burn test where we had to use a piece of acrylic to check that the mirrors were set up correctly. Now that's a trick that I never lost sight of and acrylic has become my favourite friend for the CO2 laser and I'm going to show you how important this procedure is. We're going to take the raw laser beam, bounce it off this mirror and fire it into this block of acrylic down here. Right, now I'm going to have to blow some air on here because otherwise it will catch fire. So, zero, one, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four. Well, I think you probably get the idea here. As we allow more and more time, the centre part of the beam, which is the high energy part of the beam, starts creeping forward at a much greater rate than the outside of the beam. Look, you can see virtually all of these are the same size at the mouth of the beam. It's just that the beam is getting, the beam has managed to bore its way in deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's doing it with a very, very sharp point. This sharp point is nothing to do with the focus. It's all to do with the intensity of light in the beam itself. The more intense the light, the faster damage will occur in the material. That is a key mantra that you must not forget. Seven and a half inch lens in a lens tube here. And I've set that up roughly to seven and a half inches. So we should find a fairly small dot down there. Slightly bigger. So there is a very large range here where the dot is 
not small as you can see. That's about the best focus I can get on that lens. This is a 190 millimeter focal length lens. So I've put a nozzle on to protect the lens and then we're going to set the height of this to around about 85 which is halfway down the focal range. What we're going to do now is the same test again which is a what I call a mode burn test but basically it's a penetration test. We have not changed the power so we've got the same amount of power it's just that we've got a smaller footprint to the beam now. It's got a smaller mouth diameter. So let's just see what happens when we give it just a few seconds of burn at full power. Let's see how far we can get through that block in about five seconds. Zero, one, two, three, four. And that's six and seven seconds. And the only difference between those two burns is that the diameter of the beam. Okay, so the smaller the diameter of the beam, the faster it will damage the material. That's a very, very, very important point that I do not want you to forget. Now we're at around about 130. So we're still 60 millimeters off the supposed focus. Zero, one, two. So it only took two seconds this time, and I'm fairly sure you can see why. The diameter of the beam is smaller. Okay, so I've now set this up to 190 millimeter focal distance between the bottom of the lens and the top surface of this material. And let's see how long it takes to burn through that 40 mil this time. Zero, one, and look at the burn. It's virtually parallel. The width of the beam as it enters the material determines the speed of damage. We can see that clearly as we look along here. Large, four seconds. Smaller, two seconds. Smaller, one second. So that's key lesson number two. The speed of penetration is dependent upon the diameter of the entry wound. Now I love clear acrylic. Because with the CO2 laser, it shows me exactly what's going on inside the material, which you wouldn't normally be able to see. Now, acrylic is a very interesting plastic. It's very analogous to H2O. In its normal state, it's solid at room temperature, just like ice. Ice turns to water at zero or one degree C. This stuff turns to liquid at 160 degrees C. When it gets to 200 degrees C, it just evaporates exactly the same as water. And then it produces acrylic vapor, which can be recondensed back to solid acrylic. That's just an interesting fact. But what we're now going to do, we're gonna take a small diversion and talk about material science. How is that material disappearing? Apart from evaporating, how does it get hot enough to evaporate? Because the laser beam does not have any heat in it at all. Everybody knows what that is. Yeah, it's a snake. No, it's a wave. I was never very good at art, so please excuse me. Now, what we've got here is somebody's ear. And if a sound wave hits your ear, you know what a sound wave is. It's a variation in pressure which affects your eardrum and makes it vibrate backwards and forwards. Well, the frequency of this stuff is very, very low, relatively speaking. 20 hertz, 20 cycles a second, up to maybe, when we're very young, we might be able to hear 20,000 hertz. Now here we have some atoms, and these atoms form a group which are stuck together by different strength bonds, as they call them. They're forces of attraction which hold the molecules in their correct relative positions to each other, repeated again and again and again to make a material. 
different materials are made up of different molecules. A fact, not too many people outside the truly scientific community know because they don't teach you this stuff at school. All atoms and molecules are busy doing this. At room temperature, they're vibrating like this, for example. When they get hotter, they vibrate faster. So the vibration level in a molecule is a measure of its temperature. Not scientifically perfect, but good enough for what we want in this analogy. Some more waves. But this time, they're not sound waves. This time, it's light waves. Now there is no difference in principle between sound waves hitting your ear and making your eardrum vibrate than light waves hitting a molecule and making it vibrate. There is a big difference though. This frequency is not this puny stuff. We're talking about 28 terahertz frequency. That's an incredibly high frequency. But it just so happens that that frequency is a frequency around which molecules are vibrating. So if we can fire light at a molecule, we can make it vibrate faster. If you can vibrate this molecule fast enough, and every molecule has its own vibration level where it cannot survive beyond, once you reach that point of critical destruction, some of the bonds will break down and these atoms will fly off and they will join with other atoms and they will make new chemicals. When we fire laser beam at wood, we produce smoke, fumes, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and eventually the carbon disappears into a gas. Well, that's nearly enough material science to get you through what we're trying to achieve. The critical point about this is light affects molecules. It can't drill into the center of a piece of material and damage it. It has to work from the surface in, molecule by molecule by molecule. The only reason I could drill those deep holes in acrylic was because there was light getting right down to the bottom of the hole and evaporating the material, stimulating the molecules. And it's nothing to do with focus. Yes, focus focuses light, but if you remember, we put unfocused light onto the surface of the material and it drilled a hole with a point on it. Okay, so the hole was very big, but we hadn't focused the light through a lens. And the whole point of the lens is to squash the footprint of the laser beam down to something very small to make it very intense. And that is, again, this key word, intensity. Because the greater the intensity of that light, the faster the rate at which these molecules will be vibrated. And that is why the molecules right at the centre of the beam were disappearing faster than those at the edge of the beam because the intensity of the light at the centre of the beam is significantly higher than that at the edge. So the vital bit that's missing here is a definition of what the laser beam is. Now the laser beam is a parallel beam of light, but it's not light in the normal sense of the word. Now here I've got a little model of the laser beam. Look, it's very bright at the centre and it gradually drops away to the outside. The intensity of the light in the centre is greatest. But of course, this is not doing any damage because this is not laser light. But the laser light, although it's invisible, is exactly this format. And if I was to draw a graph of the intensity within that beam, it would look something like this.
and this is a form called Gaussian, sometimes known as normal distribution. And this Gaussian distribution follows a very specific mathematical formula. And that is why the light at the centre is more intense than the light at the edge. And it is this intense light at the centre which is causing our conical burns in acrylic. There isn't enough intensity at the edge to do the same amount of damage. And remember, it's intensity of light that shakes the molecules. And if you don't shake the molecules hard enough, they're not going to disappear. We're now going to go and take a little bit more in-depth look at the laser beam and relate it back to what we've seen with our mode burns. Now there are some important properties of a laser beam which we need to talk about. I mentioned that the shape of the beam follows a very specific mathematical function. And I changed the base size here to this. It does this. Now how does it do that? Well the answer is because underneath this curve here is an area. And the area is equivalent to the power of the laser tube. So if this is 70 watts and a 12 millimeter beam, so if I reduce the footprint or the diameter of the beam to this, the area under this curve must still be the same as the area under this curve and follow the same mathematical proportions. And this is the effect that happens. So you reduce the size of the beam footprint and you increase the intensity of light within the beam. We decrease the size of the footprint here and all of a sudden it burnt much quicker. We reduce the footprint again and it burnt even quicker. And again, four seconds, two seconds, one second, all because we changed the diameter of the beam. And as we change the diameter of the beam, so effectively what we were doing was increasing the intensity of the beam. And increasing the intensity of the beam meant that it did damage quicker. How did it do damage? It was shaking molecules, remember? Keep thinking of this right down to the basic level. We are shaking molecules to destruction and making them disappear right down at the bottom of this hole, right down here. We're shaking more molecules here than we are here because at the top of the hole we've got less intensity. And because there's less intensity, the rate of doing damage is less. And that's why we get this conical burn. Now, another interesting fact is if we take a look here, we'll see some percentages. Just for example, this happens to be a one, two, three, four, five, six millimeter beam. The central two millimeters of the beam contain 68% of the power. Okay, now it doesn't necessarily contain 68% of the intensity because the intensity is nothing to do with the power. The power creates the intensity because look, the intensity goes much higher than the power. So 68% stops there, but the actual intensity is a scale up this way, measuring the height of the graph. But if you take a look, it does mean to say that as we move away from this two millimeter center point, the intensity is dropping down very, very quickly. And we haven't got that much intensity in this outer zone here. And right at the edge of the beam, look, we've only got 2% roughly. So that beam right on the outside is virtually doing nothing unless you allow a very, very long exposure time so that it can do some damage. One of the things that's required for lens computations is the beam width. Now, what is the beam width? There are two definitions of beam width, neither of which cover the whole of the beam. These are the two standard beam width calculations. This one in particular is the most likely one that you'll find on your laser beam. It's called full width at half maximum. So there's 50% of the maximum. 
there and that's the full width at that point. That's how the laser beam is defined. Well, if you use that particular diameter for the beam in a lens calculation, what about all this intensity out here? Now, here is another view of either the beam itself, or you could regard this as a picture of the way in which the mode burn is developing from virtually nothing to a sharp point here. So this is a Gaussian distribution at one, two, three, four, five, six, say 10 second intervals, how the beam is developing. So you can see how close it is to reality. Now, although this could be classed as a burn model, it can equally well be turned on its head and you regard this as being the laser beam model, the intensity in the laser beam. And this is what the laser beam looks like at full intensity, 100% power, 70 watts. It's got a beam that is sharp like this. As you decrease the power down to 10%, here's what it looks like. As you change the power in the beam, you're not just changing the intensity, you're changing the whole ratio shape of the beam. Now, if you have a rubbish beam that looks like this to start with, here's what it's going to finish up like after 10 seconds. It's only going to amplify the error that you have to start with. And bear in mind, this is the raw beam, the intensity in the raw beam at 100%. We haven't put this through a lens yet. Okay, let's look at one of the sort of lenses that we might use in our machine. This is being one of the common ones, something called a plano convex lens. Now, the problem with this lens is the spherical surface causes all sorts of strange refractions as the light rays pass through the lens, because this is not the way that a lens is designed. Look at the focal point here. It's a disaster. There is no focal point. This is the way that the lens has been designed. Again, a spherical surface, but one of the problems with a spherical surface, which is totally unavoidable, is what you see here. We get strange refractions from the outside, which are different from those towards the centre of the lens. And that causes this confusion here. We haven't got a real single focal point. One of the tricks that they use to try and make this better than this is to put another spherical concave surface underneath here. And that turns that into a meniscus lens, which doesn't 100% fix this problem, but nearly fixes the problem. So even with a meniscus lens, you have this uncertainty here, which is called spherical aberration. One of the ways that can be used to fix the problem is to use a sort of a compound lens, whereby you've got a plano convex and then you've got one of these meniscus lenses that I described earlier. And that causes a triple refraction because it's one refraction here, another one here, and another one here, which helps to focus all the rays down into a single point. Right, now I want to go back to this one. This is something that our laser community tells us we shouldn't be doing. The best way to install a lens is the way that the lens designers designed it. This is a rubbish way to use a lens, so the myth goes. I'm not entirely sure about that, because we're just about to have a look at this situation and see how it can be exploited. Now, this situation here is an exaggeration. Even with the lens the other way round, we still have got, as you've seen, a proportion of all this confusion about focal points. The focal point for these rays from the outside is different from the focal point for the rays that come down the centre, which is here.
we're now going to take a look at a model of this in a different way because this is a ray diagram based on the fact that all these rays are equal intensity. Now we know that's not the case for our laser beam. We have rays at the centre which have got much more light intensity than those at the outside. Ray tracing technology does not take into account intensity of the rays. It may include density of the rays, i.e. you can have more rays at the centre, but more rays is not the same as more intense rays. And that's what happens with this spherical aberration when you use a lens this way round. As I said, it looks like an absolute disaster zone. When you start adding light intensity into this picture, the whole scenario changes. I don't have any sophisticated modelling software for um, optical work and I hope that Photoshop will enable me to show you what's in my mind. Now what we have here is a very idealised ray diagram showing the three zones of intensity that I describe in the Gaussian distribution. Red zone, blue zone and the yellow zone. Well you can't see the yellow zone here because it's it's miscoloured behind several other layers. Now this is not only the focal point, but this is the material surface that you would normally set the focal point to enter the material at. Now people tend to imagine what's going on inside the material as being this. I can assure you it's not. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's set up this ray diagram to simulate the diagram that we've just seen where the convex side of the lens is towards the work. We've reset the different intensities to approximate what we saw before. The red intensity was happening way before the nominal focal point. The blue layer was happening before the focal point. And then the yellow layer, which is showing as orange here, was happening mm, who knows quite where. So. All of this is very uncertain. The only thing that is certain in this diagram is that wherever the material surface is, that's where the beam is going to enter. What happens below the surface is of absolute zero importance because it's what's happening at the entry point there, the wound, if you like, that's going to affect the shape of the hole. When the entry point is big, we're going to get a very slow and shallow penetration. So let's take a look at what's actually happening here. Here we've got a diverging low intensity anyway, which is so low that it's really not going to have any effect. But it may well give us some damage at the entry point here, a very small amount of damage. And then we've got these blue rays here, which are the secondary intensity rays, which are more likely to be producing some sort of damage at the surface. Okay, but you mustn't imagine that these rays are actually decreasing in intensity. They are not, because they're only having an effect at this point here. On their own, they will produce a pointed burn, which has got nothing to do with focus. So this is very misleading. At the point of entry we will get an intensity distribution and that intensity distribution will produce a point which has got nothing to do with focus at all. So this diverging beam just doesn't exist. It's just the intensity of the rays at the entry point which is important. Well this yellow beam just here is very intense. Okay so that will effectively be one of these where we've got a very small entry footprint so we shall get a lot of rapid penetration. This is nothing to do with focus and focal points. It's all to do with the beam entry size for each one of these different intensity levels. And if you can get that concept into your mind, you could begin to imagine what will happen with the beam set in this position. We should get minimal damage on the surface of the job. Then we should get a little bit of a penetration. 
which will be this conical mouth entry. But then the high, the high intensity penetration caused by this very, very small footprint here will be equivalent to one of these. Remember, this was four seconds, two seconds, one second. Well, this is one of those one second penetrations where it just flies in parallel and deep. All the focal points are doing is defining the entry point of the beam at the surface of the material. If we raise or lower the lens, we're effectively changing the intensity group of focal points for that lens. Where I've got it set there at the moment looks to be, maybe, the best focus. But is it really? So although I've raised the focal point here to something that looks maybe better than the one that I showed you previously, in reality, this entry point here is now a much bigger diameter than it was when it was down here. So it means we're going to get a wider cut and a slower penetration. So I hope this diagram will give you a bit of a feel for the way in which intensity is having a dramatic effect and not the rays. The rays are unimportant and the focus is unimportant to the end result. The thing that's important to the end result is the diameter at the entry point. I hope that that diagram explains better than a thousand words can ever do the very complex situation that exists below the focal point because we are dealing with light intensity and not light rays. I keep stressing the point, it's not light rays that stimulate molecules. Look, there are light rays out here. They're pretty useless. It's the intensity of the light rays that's doing the damage. And that's the big issue that is not accounted for when these lenses are designed. They have to be designed with a fixed focal point as though they are going to be used in a camera, a microscope, or maybe something like a projector. But a laser beam doesn't understand those rules. It's got its own rules and it exploits the weakness, the spherical aberration weakness of all lenses to produce a cutting action, as I've described here. And I've shown you how that cutting action actually takes place by virtue of an entry point into the material. There is no focal point that's causing this. That was something that kept on dragging me off to one side, that this spherical aberration had got focal points down here, which were the cause of these things. It's nothing to do with it. It's all to do with this entry point where the beam enters and the size of the beam at that entry point. And then we're also talking about the intensity of the light at that point. So change the lens and you change this whole dynamic. Turn the lens round and it might no longer be a cutting lens as this is. It may become an engraving lens because for an engraving lens, you do not want to cut deep. You want to just mark the surface. This is not going to mark the surface. This is going to cut into the surface deeply. So now you're looking for a completely different sort of lens to do engraving. Flip the lens over and it gets better at engraving. Not very good at cutting. If we start changing the power in the beam, the relationship of all these sections is going to change. Remember the model of the Gaussian distribution when I reduce the power, I change the intensity of the beam and the shape of the beam. So this is an impossible situation to actually model. You just have to live with what you've got. We cannot change the way in which the lenses are designed. We've just got to get used to the fact we cannot get anywhere near the specifications claimed for these lenses. The specifications for lenses is based around an imaging system, not a damaging system, which is what we are using. Now, I hope with all those little teeny weeny pieces of the model in mind, this, the way in which the Gaussian form changes with power, the different types of lens that we can use. We have lenses which purport to focus down to a point and lenses that purport to focus nearly to a point. And then the unapproved way in which you can use a lens like this to exact 
much deeper cutting. Am I talking rubbish? Well, let's take a look at another document that I produced recently. So anybody that wants this document can have it. There's an introduction here. I'm very lucky that with the support of Cloudray, I have got a fairly comprehensive collection of lenses that allow me to carry out lots of tests. Now the following tests were carried out with a piece of 0.3mm thick artist watercolour parchment. It's very thin. What we're seeing is basically what happens as the beam enters the material. There is no real depth to the material. So we're not going to see the sort of things that we see here. All we're going to do is basically see what we see on the end there. So here's what I've done for every one of those lenses in that chart. We're starting off here with a four inch zinc selenide PVD, Chinese type lens, which is a meniscus lens, as you can see, used curved side down. Now that's totally the wrong way to use that lens. Okay, now it's supposed to have 101.6 focal point. I've used a line test to try and determine where the thinnest line is. Remember back to my picture just now, I basically raised and lowered to find out where the thinnest line is, the intensity, the focus intensity thinnest line. And it turned out to be at 108.6 millimetres, way below the nominal focal point, just as my diagram predicted it would be. We've kept the same speed here for both of these tests. The only difference between these two is power. It doesn't matter what the power of the beam is, it just so happens to be it's a 70 watt beam, but 10% power produces thin lines and I've only got to increase it by 10% and look at the difference in the line thickness. This is proof positive that we are not dealing with a fixed focal point. If we were dealing with a fixed focal point, the line thickness would not change because all the rays are passing through one specific point, something called the spot size. So hang about, look, I've had a quick check to see what the spot size is. Now, if I take a 99% power beam and set it to 101.6 and go beep for two milliseconds and beep for 30 milliseconds, why has the beam grown? If there is only one spot size, one focal area where the beam is passing through, I should not get a picture like that. And I've already explained to you what's wrong. This is nothing to do with light ray focus. This is all to do with intensity focus. And if we zoom in, now what you're seeing here is, if we take a look at these dots, you'll see that they're virtually the same all the way along, except maybe that first one. And if you take a look at that first one, you'll see that round the outside of that, there is still a little halo of power that's doing damage to the material, even at a two millisecond exposure time. Four, six, eight, ten. Now we're starting to see more and more of this coloration taking place as we allow more and more time for the power to damage the material and make it scorch. These are scorch marks around the outside where the beam is damaging the material, but you've still got this high power spike right through the middle of the beam, which is actually cutting into the material. But if we look here very carefully, you'll see that we've got a very, it's almost like a radius edge on the material here. Then the radius is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're getting to a point here where it's, it's fairly uniform. But when I look at it in the flesh, I regarded that one, which is 109.6 focus, as being the least amount of damage. In other words, that's where I would have thought the nominal aggregate focal point is. It, it, you can see here, it's slightly difficult to do on this one because at a very long focus, we've got a very large range over which not very much is taking place. But if we start looking here again closely, we'll see that we've got some radiusing on the edge, some scorching on the edge. This is where I think the beam was set to its optimum intensity focus. But there is another part to the diagram as well. And that's this piece of acrylic on the end here. 
Now these are reflections, light reflections, off the back surface of the acrylic so you can ignore these little reflections and here is one of those pieces of acrylic. You'll see here at the top just the merest amount of indentation from a two millisecond burn. Four milliseconds, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, all the way through to thirty milliseconds. And if you take a look at thirty milliseconds you'll see that it's managed to pierce in two, four, six, eight millimetres deep because these line spacings are two millimetres. There's two bits of information that you can get from this diagram. One of them is how deep the penetration is. It tells you about the power of the beam passing through the lens. Let, let's see how long it takes to get to four millimetres deep. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. It took 12 milliseconds to bore in four millimetres deep. Now here's the same lens, but this time use the correct way round. Now because this is a meniscus lens, it should be technically zero or almost zero aberration, which means it should not be very good at cutting. This is still as good as the previous way when it was flipped round. The offset is slightly different here, but it's about the same here. So whichever way round you use this lens, it has a similar performance. And similarly, here we are, fairly similar performance. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Not much different whether you use it this way round or the other way round. But this is a four inch lens. Now. You will see a big difference now because this changes to 38.1. So this is a one and a half inch lens. This is a meniscus lens that should have very little in the way of aberration. So it will not be a good cutting lens. And what can we see here? Well, it never gets there just about. So this is a this is not the sort of lens you'd want to use for cutting. This is what I would class as an engraving lens because you can run it quite fast and you will do lots of damage on the surface, browning in other words, but not deep cutting. That's a perfect engraving lens. Look at the quality of these lines. I mean, even here at 20%, not bad. So that's a CVD face down. Here's a PVD face down. Much the same. Now, the fascinating thing is here, look at the halo. There's virtually no halo around these dots. Everything is being focused into a single focal point, but it's not the focal point. It is just a, an intensity focal point, which is close to the real focal point. I'm not gonna carry on going through all these. I mean, there's a very powerful one there. Look, the wrong way round, 38.1 two, four, six, eight. So that's an excellent cutting lens, the wrong way round. And I've just shown you now how you can read this document, but the document shows beyond any shadow of doubt that there is no fixed focal point. And the model that I'm proposing explains the reason why. Now I'm gonna add this table onto the end. This is basically a 38.1 gallium arsenide plano convex flat down. I use the same lens throughout all of these tests. I've chosen different materials. I've tested them at 400 millimeters a second with 95% power, 10 millimeters a second with 95% power, and then I've tested them 10 millimeters a second at 10% power. So I've got a range of tests here to show that not only do we get variation in the focal point, with materials and speed and power. And that's the purpose of this table here. And that means that the specification that's been promised can never be achieved because we're working with a totally different concept of machine using lenses, which are fantastic, but I don't think anybody's understood how they work because there are ways of exploiting these lenses, which are not within the normal scope of what the manufacturer expects or what 
the myths in our laser community expects. We've confused the situation by showing you clearly that the focal distance supplied with your lens is fairly meaningless because that is a light ray focus and this machine doesn't use light rays as such to damage material it uses intensity of those light rays and that produces an intensity focus which is different to the light ray focus and I hope that all the tests and experiments that I've shown you so far have convinced you of that fact. I'm now going to add a whole additional layer of uncertainty into your belief in the focal point. Now to make this video as complete as possible and to cover all possible angles I've used the manufacturer's focal point to do my acrylic tests so far but of course the intensity focal point for acrylic is completely different to the manufacturer's focal point. I ought to make sure that I choose the correct intensity focal point for that speed test. Now I've already tested some of the lenses with this additional test procedure and it's left me confused as to where the hell I'm ever going to set my focus. How can I determine where my focus should be for any particular material? When we were doing the focus test on card we were able to see the high intensity part of the beam piercing right through the centre of the card but at the same time when we were out of focus so we thought we were getting the additional low intensity rays at the outer part of the beam causing this radiusing damaging effect scorching effect on the edge of our cut and that scorching effect got less and less and less as we got closer to what we thought would be the focal point and here it is we've got a nice sharp corner we've no longer got radius corners and then as we move beyond this focal point we effectively replicate these on the other side of the focal point so we know that at that point there we've got the correct intensity focus that's using my line method of checking for intensity some people use the ramp test they run the beam up a ramp and they look for this pattern here the thinnest point being hopefully the same as that now the only thing I would caution as I have done on these tests to anybody that's using the ramp test a choose your material the same as what you're going to work on B choose the speed the same as what you're going to work on if you use a piece of plywood and 10 millimeters a second you're going to get a completely different result if you then go on to acrylic at 400 millimeters a second this ramp test needs to be used with caution because what I'm witnessing with my second set of tests it would appear that there are two focuses now one of them that's going to get you the deepest cut and one of them that's going to get you the narrowest line. Now the next thing I need to do is to establish just where that lens is in relation to the tip of this nozzle. So I've stripped the end off a q-tip here, a plastic tube, you could use a straw or something else, you could even use a cocktail stick, something that's soft and not likely to damage the lens but you can very carefully pop it in here and just find out the depth of the lens inside your nozzle and then you can measure it. And the answer is 45.3. We've got a 63.5 lens, we've got 45.2 or 45.3 inside and so what's outside the nozzle? 18.3 millimetres. I've got 8 millimetres range on my test. What I normally try to do is to test for 4 millimetres above the focal point and 4 millimetres below the focal point. I need to start my test at 14.3 so as it drops down, it drops down after four millimeters through the nominal focal point at 18.3. So we'll go for 14.5. So I'm running my focus test onto the edge of that piece of material. My reference numbers are really very very deep and they confuse the picture so what I'm going to do now is to mat that finish I'm just going to clean that surface a five millimeter line and I'm just going to very carefully scribe a reference line 
across there at five millimeters. Three things that we're interested in looking at for this test. First of all, where is the deepest cut? The third line in, which has got the dot underneath. That's why I put the five millimeter reference line there because it makes it easier to pick up the deepest cut. That's the manufacturer's focal point just there. This is the intensity focal point where we got the deepest cut. And I'll talk about that deepest cut and why we got that deepest cut in a minute because it certainly doesn't look at the top here as though we should have the deepest cut. This doesn't look like the best focus, does it? Look, it's got a pretty crappy radius on the corner. In fact, if we go and hunt for what I previously would have said was the focal point, you'll see that it is probably right the way along here, where we've got a nice sharp corner. We've got no radius on the corner, one of these two. But look at the depth of cut that we get from choosing that as our focal point. You might even consider that one there as being the narrowest line if you looked at it from above. Here I've got an example of a one and a half inch lens. The deepest cut is happening at 36.1. In other words, we buried the focus, the manufacturer's focus, two millimeters into the material. And just possibly, this may well be why people believe that they can get a deeper cut by burying the focus into the material. Now this is true, as you can see, for some lenses, but it's not true for all lenses. It just depends where this intensity focus happens to be. Well, here we've got our exaggerated lens ray diagram, but of course the rays that we're talking about here from the outside are the low intensity rays. The rays that we're really interested in are the ones that are coming down the centre. These have got the maximum intensity which is going to do the maximum amount of damage. There are some intermediate rays out here which still can do damage. So here I'm trying to describe that same lens with its red low intensity light, its medium intensity and its high intensity light. Eight millimetres which shows my focus test. I've put the four millimeters there, but in reality what I'd do is slide that four millimeters down until it matched what probably was the manufacturer's focal point. And so I'd be using plus or minus four millimeters above and below this black line. Probably starting there, I should think, because that's zero, one, two, three, four, yeah. So I'd start at zero. When people look at these ray diagrams, they see the whole picture. When you're damaging material, what's happening down here is of no consequence at all. The only thing that's of any consequence is what's happening here at this material interface. This is where the damage will occur. We've got our yellow rays here swamping the blue rays. The blue rays will have no effect at all. Here we've got a very large footprint for our intensity to act upon and it may well produce a burn that looks like that. Now when we drop it down by a millimetre the beam, the intense part of the beam, has got smaller and we know what happens when the beam gets smaller. We've got the same amount of power there, say 70 watts, but we need the same area under the curve. So what's happening now, because the footprint has decreased, the intensity has increased. We're not burning any deeper, we've just got a higher intensity beam which has the ability to burn faster and deeper. Now we move down another millimetre, an even smaller beam. So the yellow beam has now got even smaller, which means it has the ability with its intensity to burn faster. And so we carry on until we get down to here. And at this point here, although we've got a very small beam high intensity beam coming out here with a huge intensity on it which has got the potential for doing damage very very quickly. Okay, This is not, I hasten to add, the shape of the burn. This is a diagram of the intensity at this surface just here. But you'll notice something else that's happened as well now. We've got some diverging but still effective blue power that's coming in. So although we've got this very sharp focus, we're now starting to have some burning effect on this blue stuff as well. 
Okay, and as we get further down, the blue stuff becomes more and more. We've run out of intensity now, maximum intensity, and that may well be the point at which we get this little teeny weeny spike on the end of our burn. You mustn't imagine any of this stuff below the material as having any effect. It's, it's imaginary. The only thing that's happening is happening at the surface of the material. It does mean to say that this zone here might actually be the deepest cut. And as we've seen, this might not be the deepest cut. And this might not be the deepest cut either. These four tests here were done on a two inch PVD Chinese meniscus lens. Flat side down and flat side up. I've had to offset these three by a huge amount to get my focus range to come onto the pattern. The intensity focal point and the manufacturer's focal point coincide completely. But on this one, which is the same lens but, 20, but 18 millimeters diameter, the manufacturer's focal point is still 50.8, but the intensity focal point is 45.8, some five millimeters lower. I would have expected these numbers to be the same because these are all basically the same lens. As my good friend Steve Walters at American Photonics warned me, that what we get from China isn't necessarily consistent quality. There we go. The test takes no time at all. It's all the analysis that takes the time. Now, I have another example here of our focal point inconsistency. The intensity focal point for this lens is different to this lens. This is flat side up, flat side up, flat side down, flat side down. Possibly these lenses may well be perfect as far as the test conditions are concerned in the factory. But of course those are some sort of light ray conditions. They're obviously not damage conditions based on intensity of light, which is what we're looking for when we use these lenses. So our effective intensity focal point is all over the place. Now I don't know whether this is to do with geometry or whether this is to do with material quality. I'm not saying the lenses are bad, I'm just saying that for our application they're inconsistent. I very much doubt whether anybody has ever investigated lenses on a machine like this to this extent. It's so a problem that's never been seen or identified before. Now buried in the middle of the document that goes along with this video, there's a couple of interesting tables. There are three focal points associated with a lens. The red one, which is the cutting focal point, where you get the best cutting. The green one, which is where you get the thinnest line. And manufacturer's focal point, which is a third focal point that's sitting in here somewhere but totally unusable. Now the green one is what most people use for setting their focus. But look how far those are away from the most efficient depth cutting focal point. Now if you set the focal point for depth, you suffer a bit because the entrance to the cut will be wider. You either set with the green numbers and accept that your cut could be quite a lot less than possible. And the second interesting table is this one, which basically is all about the speed at which a lens can cut. I've chosen two numbers out of the following set of data. Those are the time in milliseconds that it takes to get to six millimeters of cut, which is the second number, or the first number is how long it takes to get to four millimeters of cut. You say, well, okay, what's the use of that? Well, it could be quite useful. Now, I must stress that these numbers apply to cutting acrylic. And acrylic is a particularly slow or difficult material to cut. If you're cutting MDF, these numbers will approximately apply as well. Other woods, particularly soft woods, could be twice as fast as this. For example, if you wanted to cut three millimeter birch plywood, there's a pretty fair chance that the best lens to use would be 
a gallery of arsenide plano convex flat down because it will produce a four millimeter cut in six milliseconds. In fact, it will probably produce a four millimeter cut in three milliseconds because it works roughly twice as fast as that. So you're going to get a much faster cut from this lens than you are from any of these lenses because look, these are 12, 10, 8, 8, 12s, 14s. So that's how you can use the data in that table. But equally well, you can go and examine the following data. So you can see how you can use this data here. Look, it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 to get to 4 millimetres, 14 milliseconds. So this is not a very efficient lens for cutting 4 millimetre material. There are some interesting strange anomalies which you look at here and you say, well, that's rather interesting. I wonder what these lines are because look, they're the same lines in every one. Now there's an, in there's an interesting one. If we look at the way the beam is growing, two, four, six, eight, and there it is. That gets to, that gets to um, four millimeters in eight milliseconds. But something else is strangely happening here. If we start looking at this line here at about two millimeters, we see something strange happening. It's developing just here and it starts to develop definitely along here. Look, we've got almost like a waste, a focal point, which sits there at two millimeters all the way along. And then look what happens after that two millimeter point. We start getting ballooning of the cut. Now that's an interesting question that I'd like you to consider. What do you think is happening to cause that effect? I'll leave you with those sort of things to think about. There's not a single focal point when we start using these lenses with a laser beam. And I think that all this data will prove that beyond any shadow of doubt. What we've been told for the last many years, it's just a misunderstanding that what we do with a laser beam can be an extension of what they do with telescopes, etc., etc. We're not imaging, we are damaging material. Well, I might look very chilled and relaxed. I've still got to complete this test work and get it documented. But hey, I'm going to close the lid on this Pandora's box lenses. They've been nothing but a pain. And the problem is, focus is now very blurry. I can't unlearn what I've already learned. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Now, I better get on that plane to the foreign island because I'm sure there's now a price on my head. Is there a next session? I'll say cheerio anyway.